So we're very glad to have all of you assembled with us this morning. We do have some that are missing because of their travels, and we definitely will be praying for them that they will have a safe trip back to us and be able to assemble with us at the next point of time. And as always, want to give recognition to those that are watching through Facebook, those that are near, and those that are far off. And we definitely encourage those that are close to us to come out and visit with us and assemble with us so that you can partake in the very thing that we're going to be discussing today when we are considering 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and what is the design and what is the purpose of coming together and being brought together in assembly just like what we're doing today. And that priority, as we've seen here is the, the title of our sermon and our study, the priority of our coming together is edification. And the word edification, edification, exhortation, encouragement, they are in fact similar, but it all carries with it the idea that we are being built up. You are putting together an edifice, edification. We are building something. And as we are described as being lively stones that are being put together inside of the Lord's house, we then need to understand, or we should understand just how important it is that we as these stones, that we are as strong as we possibly can be. Because a builder who's building a wall and you come across a brick that, you know what, structurally, it's got cracks, it's missing pieces, it's got chips in it, you're not going to want to put that in the wall because that's going to end up being a weakening to that particular section. So when we're going through and we're considering ourselves as these stones, we're needing to make sure that we are being built up together, that we are in fact being strengthened. And that's what these assemblies are designed for. We're going through our week and we have to deal with difficult coworkers. Could be the case that you've got a boss that is difficult to deal with, neighbors that are troublesome, uh, even family members that are quarrelsome and they are just difficult to get around. And when they are around, they are worldly, they're fleshly, they're carnal. Having to be around those type of people all the time, mm -hmm. guess what ends up happening? You end up finding yourself being influenced to be like them. As we're trying to strengthen ourselves spiritually, being out in the world is, that's taxing, that's tiring. And it takes a toll on us to where what do we need? Okay, we need a time to where we're able to come back together to be lifted up once again. Now, of course, <clears throat> we have the opportunity, we have the ability to build ourselves up anytime that we need. It's not just coming together for these assemblies. I'm able to study on my own, be involved in different types of Bible studies, whether I'm listening to sermons on YouTube or whatever platform, podcasts that you, you know, desire to do that. We all have these other realms or these other times where we can be involved in edification, but there is something particular and special about coming together collectively as a body, being brought together in fellowship. I can do these things on my own, but I still have the responsibility and the need of doing these things together. So when many people look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, they want to focus in on the fact that, well, you know, Paul is addressing speaking in tongues to a great degree inside of this chapter. Well, just like we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and how many people view that chapter as the head covering chapter, that's actually not what that chapter is about. That chapter is about a recognition of authority, if you remember us going through that. So this chapter, just because Paul is using tongues to prove a point and he's using it as a means of illustration, it's not about speaking in tongues. It is, in fact, about edification. The speaking in tongues is actually disrupting the edification that is supposed to take place. So we can actually see by that illustration how that Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I hear that there be divisions among you and that when you come together, you come together not for the better, but for the worse. So just because people are coming together today, we have a whole host of individuals throughout this valley it's Sunday, the Lord's Day. They're all gathering together. They're assembled. But just because they're assembled does not mean that they are assembled for the better. That they're assembling actually is not good. And if it's not involved in edification, then it's not going to be a good assembly. So let's look at some, some information from our text this morning. First Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 3. 
We're going to run through some verses and just take note of all the times that we have this word edification, edifying, edify, being used. But he that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Why are we coming together? The whole purpose that we're coming together is not so that we can show off in these miraculous abilities. It is not so that we can be brought together and be uh, stirred up in some type of emotionalism. That, oh, you know, we have a lot of individuals, they come together and say, I want to, you know, I want to feel something. That's not what these brethren are coming together to do. They are coming together for edification, notice this, and exhortation, encouragement. And notice, we have comfort when we're coming together inside of these assemblies. What is it designed to do? To edify, exhort, and comfort. By what means? He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Now, notice verse 5. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. So all throughout this verse, we have this emphasis being put on one is greater than the other. And why is that? Because with one, the entire congregation, notice the church is able to be edified. Drop down to verse 12, and then also notice in verse 17. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel, notice, to the edifying of the church. Here is the area in which we are supposed to excel, to go above and beyond, and that is found in the edifying of the church. Verse 17, for thou verily givest thanks well, Notice, and this is in reference to an individual that's speaking in tongues without an interpreter, but the other is not edified. Verse 26, how is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Notice, let all things be done unto edifying. What's the goal? What is our aim? Why bring up the misuse of tongues in this chapter? Because they are disrupting the purpose of the assembly. As we mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, how that love has certain characteristics and there are certain things that love does not do. One of the things that we mentioned or that Paul mentions and that we studied is how that love vaunteth not itself. It doesn't parade itself. It doesn't boast itself. What are these brethren doing? They are trying to promote themselves, and by doing that, they're disrupting the assembly. Everybody is coming, and everybody is trying to speak in tongues, because for whatever reason, they're promoting that as being superior. Well, guess what? If that's what you have going on inside of the assembly, Paul says that is not edifying. So what about your assembly? It's not good. So we can take this, and if we wanted to make some modern-day application, those in the charismatic movement, Pentecostal churches, apostolic churches, churches of God, Church of God Incorporated, so on and so forth, where they come together and their assemblies, what are they focused on? Their assemblies are focused on trying to get this stirred up. Let's get everybody riled up and built up emotionally. And let's try to have a breakout of the spirit. And then you just have people running around the building. The music is jamming to a degree where you can't even hear yourself think, and then somebody wants to get up and start talking in gibberish. Now, they'll walk away from that, and they will say, oh, we felt something today. Okay, you felt something, but did you learn anything? Was anybody built up? Was anybody edified? Paul is saying very clearly, if this is what's going on in your assembly, and everybody's just speaking in tongues, and nobody's understanding what's going on, there is no edification. So the assembly is not focused on emotionalism. 
or this overemphasizing of spiritualism. Oh, we just gotta, we've got to get together and we've got to let the Spirit move. <laughs> the Spirit moving in the first century was through, as we're going to mention, we're going to break down prophecy, teaching, and giving information. These brethren were coming together, not trying to feel something, trying to learn something. And so if people, are, are, if people today are coming together for any other reason than to actually learn something, it's not the edification and you're assembling together is not good. To edify, to build up, and to increase spiritually, Paul encourages. He would encourage the first century brethren. They were being built up in their knowledge. We are being built up in our knowledge of the Scriptures. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 32, after Paul gives the warning, how that after he leaves Ephesus, that many wolves, grievous wolves, are going to come in, devouring the flock, not sparing any. How are they to fight that? How are they to ward off what was coming? And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace. Notice, which is able to build you up. In the first century, the emphasis is being placed upon study. And well, that's what Paul wrote to Timothy, and that Timothy was to teach to others. Study to show thyself approved. Well, why do I need to study? I've got all these miraculous gifts. Because the miraculous gifts are not designed to build you up. It's the Word and it's the instruction that is designed to do that. So if you're going to an assembly and you're not getting any type of instruction, you are not getting a full serving of God's Word, you need to find a new place to go. And so that's one of the things that we are encouraging individuals in this area to come and see about us is that though they may find our assemblies boring compared to other assemblies that are going on throughout town, our assemblies are designed to edify because they are done. We are practicing what God says we're supposed to do. And everything that God says that we're supposed to do is designed to edify and to build up. So going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, notice verse 1. He continues in the same thought that we just had in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. How that charity is superior in all things, even above the miraculous gifts that they had. And so he continues with that, follow after charity. Why? Because charity never fails. He concludes uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 by saying that, the, you know, we have these three, faith, hope, charity, but even with those, he establishes that charity, greatest, the greatest of these is charity, love. So follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts. In the first century, they needed these because they do not have a New Testament. The information that they are receiving is in part, it's being given to them by revelation, inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So he says, desire spiritual gifts, but then he goes on and says, rather that ye may prophesy. So the word desire literally means to pursue. It denotes energy and effort that are put forth in gaining these things. But when I am considering what is being mentioned in this chapter, to desire after spiritual gifts, what am I actually desiring after? What are the spirit or what are the, the gifts of the spirit designed to do? They are designed to edify. So that's ultimately what I'm desiring after. Do I pursue, do I desire being edified and built up in the truth? Many people do not. Many people are just involved in going through the motions of religion. Well, I'm going through and I'm doing what the Bible says, but I'm not gaining anything from it. I'm not being built up. I'm not being strengthened to go out and live better than I did last week. Well, then guess what? Your assembly is in vain. Your coming together is worthless. And that's not just you know, uh, something on the denominational front. That's even something that our own brethren have a problem in doing. Well, we're members of the Lord's church. We come and we worship this way and we've got everything right doctrinally. But how are you improving? How are you growing? How are you making yourself better? And if you're not, you need to come out of them because they are going to, in fact, be a, con a congregation, a church, an assembly. They are individuals that are dying on the vine. They're not producing any type of fruit. 
edification goes towards this building of fruit or producing of fruit. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6. As we said, charity, love, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Coming together to be edified, built up in truth. I want to know truth at all costs, even if it might oppose me. Even if I find myself walking contradictory to truth, I want to know what the truth is so that I can change, so that I can stop doing this and start doing what I'm supposed to be doing. How many individuals can, you, can truly say, I'm coming to the assembly for this purpose alone? Not many can. Why do they go to the church that they go to. Well, it's close by. It's close to my house. don't have to travel far. Well, this is where my family's always gone. My grandparents were fundamental in building this church, establishing this church. Well, they've got all these different programs for the, you know, for the children. They can give you a long laundry list of things as to why they assemble there. <laughs> Had one guy tell us that he, he went to a certain church and I don't know necessarily that he was joking, but he, this is what he mentioned. He liked their seating. It was like an amphitheater type situation, and they had comfortable chairs. People will go through a long list, and guess what you'll never find inside of that list? Because they teach the truth. That tells me right there, you're not concerned with the truth. If that's not at the top of your list, then you really are not concerned about truth. And thus, you're not concerned about being edified. You're not concerned about being built up. Because and being built up gives the implication that, you know what, there's something wrong with me and there's something that I, that I need to change. And I can go to this church and guess what? Just come as you are. That's not how this operates. You are coming with the mentality and the mindset of, okay, I need to be changed. I need to be built into something else. Follow after charity, desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. So as we said, Paul does not eliminate spiritual gifts. First century, they needed them. But the spiritual gifts were given for a purpose. Prophecy has to do with teaching. The fact that Paul would establish that as being superior, as being the premier gift that you are needing is because this is the number one way that the church is edified, that the church is strengthened, that is built up by teaching. This is a process of learning. Tongues is an emotional thing. You watch any denominational preacher on television, or if you are in a denomination where they practice speaking in tongues, Notice it's only at a crescendo of emotion. And usually if you are involved in, a, in an assembly, it's only when the music really starts going. How strange it is that tongues and the Holy Spirit, He only comes when the music comes. And guess what? When the music stops, He stops. You never see anybody doing this out in public. It's only in these type of settings. They get all fired up, and then they just start using gibberish. I have seen books, I've seen materials from charismatic churches where they actually try to teach you how to speak in tongues. I don't think anybody here actually had to learn how to speak in tongues. Acts chapter 2, they just started speaking in different languages. All of this is showing you're not following through the processes that was happening here in the first century. What was the purpose of a tongue? To edify. To teach somebody that would come in and not know the language that you know. You have strangers coming into Corinth and possibly they do not know Greek. So what are you going to need? You're going to need somebody with this gift to be able to give the information over to them. So even with tongues, it's all about teaching. Not just getting up and showing off. And putting on a show to where it's like, oh man, we get to go home and we get to talk about this. To a large degree... What is going on in the first century, and even with what's going on with our assembly today, there's going to be a lot of lecturing. For a lot of people today, that's not interesting. 
That sounds like boring. That sounds boring. That sounds like work. Well, that's what they were doing. Teaching, preaching, being found in edifying the entire congregation. But prophecy and teaching is connected to intellect, not to my emotion. Notice in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6, Paul writing to these brethren, and he encourages them. As ye have therefore received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. How do they receive? How are they supposed to walk in him? Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith. How does all this take place? As ye have been taught. But I don't want to go through that teaching process. Well, then you're not going to be rooted. You're not going to be built up. See, they're edified. How does that come? By the means of teaching. Abounding therein with thanksgiving. Staying in it with joyfulness. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. The only way to stand against this, and here again we have a very important point, the fact that Paul is warning against false teaching. There is truth and there is error, and you need to beware. You need to watch out for it. Everything that everybody is teaching is not acceptable. Just because they claim to be teaching it from the Bible or even receiving it from the Holy Spirit, that they will spoil you. That means make you a ransom. Like pirates or another nation that comes in to conquer a land and they steal you away and take you captive. The purpose that we have been given, here we have the purpose of our study. The purpose of preaching, the, pers- the purpose of teaching is for edification. As we mentioned earlier on, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, here is Paul, an inspired writer, speaking to another inspired person, and notice that he is encouraging this inspired person to continue to study. Well, why do they need to study? Because as we've already looked at, these gifts were not designed to last forever. The gifts are going to go away, and the only thing you're going to be left with is God's Word. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And again, we have another warning, but shame, uh, shun provane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. The more we have of different teachings, different forms of doctrine, guess what we have? We have more ungodliness. That doesn't bring you closer to God. It leads you further away. How are we supposed to stop this? How do we give warning? By studying, by teaching, by building up the rest of the brethren, building up the entire congregation. How does that come? By miraculous gifts only? No. It comes through instruction, teaching, and learning that is being given. Notice verse 2, 1 Corinthians 14. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. Why is that important? Because this is the very fact as to why we're coming together. I'm coming together because I am needing more understanding. Howbeit in spirit he speaketh mysteries. So as we've mentioned before, it's unfortunate that we have this word unknown inserted into the text. Unknown is italicized, and that by the translators, putting it in there so as to bring more sense, or at least they thought, to the context. Easily could have just put foreign language in this. For he that speaketh in a tongue speaketh not unto men but unto God. If I stood up this morning in our Bible class and I just started going through our Bible class in Greek or in Spanish, I don't know anybody here that really is fluent in either of those languages. So that information that I'm giving, I'm giving information, but I'm not talking to you. I'm not speaking unto men. Who's the only one left to know what I'm saying. 
the only one know, to know what I'm saying to what I'm presenting as actually being truth and right is going to be God. What good does that do to the congregation? To everybody else? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Speaking in, my in mysteries, notice here, as we said, Acts chapter 2 and verse 5 and 6, they came together and here are these individuals, here are these men, and they said, we hear every man speak in his own language. Why is this necessary? Well, the information that the apostles are giving out. They are teaching these Jews. This Jesus that you've crucified, he was buried and now he's raised. And now he's ascended into heaven. And you have all these different languages that are coming together. How are they supposed to receive that information, that teaching, that instruction? By the use of language, the use of tongues. It is being used in that context so as to build them up and to lift them up. For no man understandeth him. As we said, there's no profit in this. There is no edification. And people today will make all kinds of excuses as to why their preacher or whoever gets up and starts jibber-jabbering as though they're speaking in tongues. If Paul were in your assembly, he would tell you, you need to stop that because you're not helping anybody. You may get everybody stirred up and they may start hooping and hollering with you and get all excited, but in the end, what did you learn? What did you understand? Oh, I didn't understand any of it. No profit, no edification, dealing with mysteries, that which is still in revelation and that which is still kept secret. That's not what we're here to do. We're not here to spread more mystery. We're here to give information to reveal so people are able to understand. Notice verse 3. As we, we read it before, but now we're going to start breaking these things down. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification. I need to speak in a way and in a fashion so that men are able to be edified. Guess what? That's going to be in English. That's how we speak to one another. Not only do I need to speak unto men so as to edify, but also to lead them into exhortation, to encouragement, to live better lives. And then also this, notice, to comfort. It's a shame that a lot of our assemblies of our brethren are lacking in this area. that a lot of the times the assembly is not a place of comfort, of rest, and of refuge. But this is why we assemble. This is why we have the command to come together. Because no man is an, no man is an island. We need fellowship. We need association. We need connection. And this is also why we study on our own. So that when I'm away from my brethren, I can continue to be built up. I can continue to be exhorted and I can continue to be comforted with what God's word teaches us. Verse 4, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth, notice, edifieth the church. As I said, if I went through Bible class speaking in Spanish and I understand Spanish, then okay, that information helps me. It's a benefit to me, but what about the rest of you? Might as well just stay at home if you're going to be doing that. Since edification is connected with understanding, and that's the key in all of this. We're coming together so that we have understanding, and that's how we're edified. The man that was speaking in tongues, he knew what he was saying. Now, why is that an important point? Because many people today, in misusing this chapter, they will say, well, I'm just speaking in some, you know, in some tongue. I don't know what I'm saying. The man that's spoken a tongue, if he's being edified, he knows what he's saying. So all of this is flying in the face of those that would come together just for the sake of, well, let's just have a big party. Let's just have a big pep rally and actually have no instruction, no teaching, and no idea, clue of what it is we're even doing. What this is actually doing is that this is giving structure to our assembly. 
it helps to answer those individuals that would say, well, you know, there, there really is no foundation. There is no list when it comes to what the assembly is supposed to be. Oh, yes, there is. Because even at the end of this chapter, Paul is going to say, let all things be done decently and in order. You cannot come together and have an assembly and it be in chaos. Dysfunctional. That doesn't edify anybody. Edification and understanding, as we said, are all over this chapter. That's why you come together is to gain instruction, to get teaching. So it cannot be an angel language that the person does not understand, like many people try to claim. If so, you would have the apostles preaching in Acts chapter 2 and not knowing what they were preaching. How ridiculous would that be? All that does is produce confusion. And God is not the author of confusion. That's in this chapter too, as well. He's not the author of confusion. Things are to be done decently and in order. Why? Because that brings strengthening. Well, that sounds boring. The only reason why it sounds boring is because you don't appreciate the truth. You've been deceived into thinking that here is what worship is supposed to be. And you do not find any example of anybody in the first century, first century worshiping the way people claim to worship today. So, for the speaker to be edified, he had to be given the ability to know what he was saying. Prophesying, teaching, edifieth the church. The entire congregation, they understood, so he has to understand. All of this is about bringing more understanding. And when we think about just those that we talk with on a daily basis, those that we are in communication with and trying to teach them the Bible, it is amazing and to a great degree, it's very sad as to how little understanding they actually have of the Scriptures. And it just, it causes you to step back and to ask the question. It's like, what are you getting from where you're going? It is very clear that as we talk to people, they are not getting anything when it comes to having them properly and correctly understand what the Bible teaches. That's the reason why we are encouraging people to learn more about us. Because with this assembly, as you're watching it uh, through Facebook, you are seeing firsthand, you're able to witness firsthand what our assemblies are all about. It's here on the screen. Teaching God's Word and understanding what it says. And even then, for what purpose? As we said, edifying, building us up, strengthening us so we can live better, stronger lives than we did the week before. Continuing to improve ourselves and then being able to take it out to others. Notice verse 5 again. I would that you all spake with tongues, but rather that you prophesied. Notice, for greater is he that prophesieth. Well, Paul, I thought you already said that one gift is not greater than the other. Though the eye is not the nose, can the eye say, well, has no need of me? No, you can't say that. The reason for this is because he's answering, he's correcting what the brethren were already involved in doing. They were already in this practice of trying to elevate tongues above, above everybody else, and Paul is having to bring them right back into proper understanding that if you're going to use the gift of tongues, you need to use it like you do prophecy. Not to show off, not to get everybody worked up in a frenzy, but so that people may receive edifying. For greater is he that prophesieth than, than he that speaketh with a tongue. Except, notice, here's the exception clause. Except he interpret. Now what difference does that make? Paul explains that the church may receive edifying. So anybody that is in an assembly today, and they have somebody up there that's speaking in tongues, but there's nobody up there to interpret, that's not doing anybody any good. The only way that tongues are useful is if there's an interpreter 
because then the church receives edifying. The only way tongues edifies is if another interprets. Gives the understanding. Gives the meaning. Well, what did they say? Here's what they said. Oh, okay. I understand now. But if you're just getting up there and speaking in tongues and nobody knows what you're saying, nobody's benefiting from that. Now, some might look at us and say, how, you know, how dare you talk about our assembly and how, you know, how we're not getting anything out of this. This is what the Bible is saying. You can take it up with Paul. Take it up with God. So here we have God dictating what's going on in the worship assembly. You don't get to do whatever you want to. God is dictating, if you're going to speak in tongues, have an interpreter. But if you're not going to have an interpreter, he's going to say, be quiet. Notice, drop down to verse 28. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Does worship have rules? Yes, it does. In the Old Testament, it had all kinds of rules. And then people, when we get to the New Testament, they want to act like, Worshiping God, coming together in assembly has no rules. If you do not have an interpreter, let him keep silent and let him speak to himself and to God. How many people that are assembling claiming to be able to speak in tongues and yet they have no interpreter? That is a flat out rebellion to what God teaches, to what God has said. The one that is speaking is not the interpreter. If there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. Because if you did that, you then would give room for deceit. Well, let me speak in tongue and let me also give you the interpretation. No, I don't think so. Because even still, I have no idea what you said. And you could be telling me a lie as to what you actually said. Now go back to verse 6. Now, brethren... Paul aligns himself in this. He lays application to himself. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Paul could come into the assembly, and he could come in speaking any language that he desired. And I'm sure people would just, oh, ooh, oh, look at this. This is amazing. But what's a profit? Well, yeah, you're all excited, but what did you learn? What have you gained? What shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? These are the areas where people gain profit. Revelation, revealing some mystery from the Old Testament. That leads to edification. The giving of knowledge, prophesying, teaching, lecturing, or by a study of doctrine. All of these categories, people today look at that and they say, man, that's the worst. But that's what it's all about. Here is the purpose. What purpose? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Why are they given the gifts? To help everybody, not just the person with the miraculous ability. The tongue had to bring instruction. If it does not, then there is no place for it. Notice verse 7 and 8. And even things without life, giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? Under the Old Testament system, you had the Levites that they would blow on the trumpets when it was time to assemble. Well, that had a specific sound. What if the Levites, they decided, you know what, we're going to blow a different sound today and try to get people to assemble? That's not going to work because people are going to question, what does that sound mean? If you're out in battle during this time frame, they would use different instruments to give different commands to the soldiers. If you heard this sound, it means it goes into this formation. 
If you hear this sound, it means go into this formation. If you hear this sound, it means retreat. But what if somebody decided, you know what, I'm going to give some sound that nobody knows. Well, that doesn't help us. What are we supposed to do? What good is a person standing up, speaking in a tongue, a language that I don't know? Okay, it sounds good, but what does it mean? No idea. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? A distinct sound so as to instruct. So our teaching, teaching, singing, praying in the assembly, it must be distinct and it must be clear so that people can understand. Because without understanding, there cannot be any edification. As we said, our teaching, it must be distinct. A lot of people want to try to talk in or teach and preach in generalities. They want to teach in vague terms, not really being clear, not being distinct. That doesn't help anybody. If we're talking about a certain issue, then we need to talk about the issue so that the audience knows exactly what we are discussing. Understanding clearly what the Bible teaches, not in generals, but specific. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 12. Seeing then that we have such hope, notice, we use great plainness of speech. We're all adults here. We're all brethren. We're dealing with spiritual matters. Let's just call a spade a spade. Let's use plainness of speech. Let's not beat around the bush. And even in verse 9, Paul is going to illustrate that as well. So likewise, ye except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. You know, there are some preachers, even in the Lord's church, there are some preachers that are like this. That you have no clue what they are saying unless you have a dictionary there with you. I love Foy Wallace, but man, Foy Wallace is one of the worst when it comes to giving words that are easy to be understood. He's got great material, but he could have worded it better. To where a lot of people, they don't want to take the time to read his material. They don't want to read his books because of how hard it is. And because of that, they're missing out on a great deal of information, wealth of information. Well, guess what? When we come together in our assemblies, I don't need to try to talk over everybody's heads. And James Harding, or the biography of James Harding, <laughs> he writes of himself, or there's a story of him that when shortly after he got out of preacher training school and he started going around and trying to help newly established congregations, you go to school and you learn all these fancy words and you, you, know, you want to try to show off what you've learned. And he started going to these little country churches where these new Christians were assembling, and he had one brother come up and say to him, you know, Brother Harding, what you said, it sounded really good, but I don't have a clue as to what you said. It's like speaking into the air. It's just up there, and it's just floating. Sounds nice, and somebody may even come up and tell you, that was a wonderful worded sermon but they cannot tell you one thing that they gained from it. Not one thing that they are able to use so as to make themselves better. Our assemblies are not a place where we just get to go, get up, stand up, and promote ourselves and show how smart, intelligent, or how wonderful we are. The times of assembly are a place to receive easy teaching. To receive understanding. On what the scriptures say and how I can improve myself. Verses 10 and 11. 
There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices. That simply means languages. There may be many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, if I know not the meaning of the language, he says, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. A barbarian would be one that did not know Greek. And just like any person that would come in and read from Greek, we don't speak Greek here. So what are you going to sound like? You're going to sound like a barbarian, and barbarian literally in the Greek translation is just bar-bar. So it would be like me standing up here and just saying bar-bar-bar-bar-bar-bar-bar the entire time. And Paul's going to go on to say, they're going to think you're crazy for behaving that type of way. Now, in that context, he uses crazy in a negative context. We're not wanting people to come together and think that we're crazy. But yet, what do religious people do today? They get together and they try to act crazy in their assembly. And they want to, they want to then present that as if that's them being spiritual. Paul teaches, no, if you want to be spiritual, you have your wits about you. You don't act crazy. You do not act like a barbarian. You come together for teaching and instruction. Instruction. What value was that? And so as we bring this to a close today, we want to ask not only those that are watching this by uh, means of our live stream, but we want to ask ourselves, what value did we get out today? We need our own brethren that would be watching this stream. Wherever you are assembling, ask yourself, later on today, what good was that? What value was that? Of us coming together, sitting through the sermon, the singing, everything, what value did it hold? What profit did it bring? And if you look back and you cannot categorize any type of profit from what, from your time in that assembly, I would be encouraging you to find a new place to assemble. Now, the problem with that is twofold. There could be a problem with me. To where I'm so puffed up and I'm so high-minded in myself that I think that there's not anything that I could gain. So if you're looking at the assembly and you're saying, well, I didn't really gain anything from that, I would check yourself first before you start putting blame on the preacher or one of the elders or who, you know, whoever taught Bible class. Because it very well could be the case that the problem is with you. That you're not getting anything because you don't think there's anything that you need. But if I am a person that realizes, no, I have these problems in my life and I'm looking for understanding, I'm looking for instruction in ways in which I can improve my life and I'm not getting it, go talk to the teacher, go talk to your elders, let them know of what's needing to change and if things don't change, make a move. But definitely for those that are out in the denominational world, that are in man-made churches, that are following after man-made traditions, and you are going to a, an assembly, calling it worship, and actually it's a circus, you for sure are needing to find a new place. And we would recommend that that place is with us. And we're not doing that to be boastful, to you know, simply brag on ourselves, but and as you're able to witness with this sermon, the reason why we're going through this sermon is not just for the benefit of letting the community know what we are focused on and what our importance is, but it's, as we mentioned, it's for us first. We are coming together. The material is being put together with the intention of first and foremost building us up. Because life is hard. 
And we have an enemy, an adversary, that is out there trying to destroy us. And he is wanting to tear us down. And if he's wanting to tear us down, then we have to be in the processes of building ourselves back up to rise above his influence, to rise above his temptation and his snares. And we have many ways in which we're able to do that. We can study on our own, listen to other individuals, other preachers, teachers that give us encouragement, edification, uplifting. And we need to make sure that we are involved in that throughout the week. Because at some point, everybody grows weak. So find a way to be strengthened. Study, pray, sing, you know, sing on your own. But then we have this time where we're able to come together in a group setting. To be brought back into remembrance that there are others that are struggling with me. That as we're gathered here and I can look around and I can see fleshly faces looking back at me and knowing, you know what, they're being tempted just like I am. And they keep going. And so if they keep going, why should I stop? So if anyone, if there are those that are not, this is not the kind of instruction teaching that you're receiving, you need to start. And we would encourage any that has not obeyed the gospel as of yet, that they need to do that. The Bible plainly teaches in words that are easy to understand that a person is to hear the gospel being presented. Romans 10 verse 17, they're to believe that message. They are to repent of their sins, repent of their past life, to be converted into the life of Christ, to confess Him as being the Son of God, to be baptized in water for the remission of their sins. Having your sins forgiven by God's operation, Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. And then after that, the fun is just beginning. Striving to live faithful, walking in the light as He is in the light. That is where for us as members of the Lord's church, where our encouragement, exhortation, and edification comes in. That as we go through and we are striving to be built up, one of the first things possibly that needs to take place is we need to make a confession that, you know what, I've allowed this area of my life to grow weak. And that I need prayers and I need further encouragement from my brethren, from others that understand the difficulties of this life. So as we stand and sing together, offering this time of invitation for any that have a need, we ask that you come while we stand and while we sing together.